Hi, I'm James, and I'm the product expert for Affinity Photo. Version 2 of the Affinity apps has just been released, and there are many exciting new features and upgrades to existing functionality across designer, photo, and publisher overall. But in this video, we're going to focus on what's new in version 2 of Affinity Photo. Let's get started. First, before we dive into the new features, I want to talk briefly about the user interface. It's had a significant overhaul across all three Affinity apps, especially in key areas such as the Layers panel. Adjustment and Filter layers now have their own unique thumbnail icons. Layer types are now identified by the icons next to the thumbnails rather than in bracketed text. You can hover over these for tooltips that denote the type of layer. Parent and child layering has been reworked as well. The distinction between masking and clipping drop zones is now much clearer, and reordering child layers is easier to achieve as well. As you start using version 2 of the apps, you will notice many other small changes to the user interface layout and methodology designed to improve the overall experience. Now let's move on to the new features. So first on the list, and it feels like everyone has been asking for this, non-destructive RAW is here. So you can now redevelop your RAW files at any time without ever committing the changes you've made to them. Let me show you how it works. I've opened my RAW file here, and I've been taken to the develop persona. But I now have this output drop-down on the top context toolbar. It defaults to pixel layer, which has always been the previous behavior. But now we also have raw layer embedded and raw layer linked. Embedded will save the raw file along with your layer work so the whole document is self-contained. Linked will maintain an external link to the raw file, so this will make the document file size smaller, but you will need to have that original raw file available if you want to redevelop it. I'll set my output to raw layer embedded, then I'll make a couple of quick changes. So I might push the brightness up, increase the clarity, and perhaps increase the contrast slightly. Then I'll click Develop. So now that I've developed my RAW file, I'm in the main photo persona, and I might do some additional layer work. For example, I'll add an HSL adjustment, and I'll increase the saturation of the reds, then decrease the saturation of the cyans and the blues. Now let's say I wanted to go in and revise the initial development of my RAW image. There are two ways I can do this. One is to simply double click on the thumbnail of the RAW layer, and that takes us straight back into the develop persona. The other option, which I'll just quickly show you, is to have the RAW layer selected. Then switch to the move tool using V, and on the context toolbar up here, we have the develop image option. Regardless of which method we used, we're taken back into the develop persona, and all the options are set to the values they were at previously. So, for example, I might reduce clarity. Then I'll also just intensify the highlight detail. So remember I just added that HSL shift adjustment? Well, we're currently still seeing it rendering. But if we uncheck show all layers up here, we will now only see the raw layer. So it's entirely up to you. If you want to preview what your raw image looks like with all of your layer work rendering above it, you can. Or alternatively, you can just choose to see the original raw image by itself. I'll click develop to redevelop my raw image and move back to the photo persona for further editing. Now, I know this video is supposed to be all about photo, but I couldn't not show you this because it's really cool. If you have Publisher and Photo installed on the same machine, you can redevelop placed RAW files in Publisher. So for example, I'll just go out to my file browser and I'll place some RAW files. I'll just reposition this one. Then go out and get some other RAW images, drag them in, reposition them. There we go. I'll just get my third image here. And my fourth. OK, so I've got my four placed raw images. If I now want to redevelop them, I need to access the raw layers. And to do this, I can either expand the picture frame 
on the Layers panel, or I can double click on the picture frame within the document view, and this will automatically select the child raw layer. Then I can choose develop image up here, and we now move directly into the develop persona. For this image, let's try pushing the brightness up like so, and perhaps also just increasing the contrast slightly. Then I can click develop to commit those settings and move back to the main publisher persona. Let's do the same for this image. I'll double click to access the child raw layer. Then this time I'll double click on the thumbnail. If we zoom into this image, it's quite noisy. So I can go to the details panel and just increase the luminance noise reduction. Then I might go to the basic panel, increase the brightness, the vibrance, and perhaps add a small amount of clarity as well. And once again, I'll click develop to commit those settings. And there we go. I just wanted to show you that functionality in Publisher as well, because it's quite exciting. Next, we have compound masks. These allow you to combine multiple masks together non-destructively, and you can change the operator for each individual mask. So you can build up a combination of masks that are added to, subtracted from, or intersected with one another. Here's an example. I've converted some grunge border textures to masks. Ordinarily, once you have more than one mask affecting a layer, they will just intersect and you have no control over this blending. However, now I can add a compound mask. Then I'll just select these mask layers and drop them in. Now, with the additional masks, you can change their operators and I can experiment freely with combinations of different operators for each mask until I find a result that I like. This gives me much more flexibility than trying to destructively add to, subtract, and intersect from one mask layer. I can even hide certain mask layers if I decide I don't want to use them. For more ideas of how to use compound masks, do have a look at the video tutorial I've done as well. Live mask layers are another welcome addition to the roster of non-destructive functionality that Affinity Photo has. We currently have three types of live mask layers, and I'll show you luminosity range masks first. Now on this example, what I might do is add a brightness contrast adjustment. Then I'll push the brightness up until I'm revealing more detail in the darker areas. Now, unfortunately, by doing this, I end up overexposing the light trails. This is where the luminosity range mask comes in. So I'll go to layer, new live mask layer, and add a luminosity range mask. By default, this mask child layers into the brightness contrast adjustment, which is what we are after. So now, on the luminosity map graph here, I can click drag this right hand node and bring it down. You'll see that we can very easily control the tonal range the brightness contrast adjustment can affect. This is very similar to using the curves adjustment if you're familiar with how that works. So I can click drag to add additional nodes to the graph. I can check preview up here to see a quick grayscale representation of what my mask is doing then modify it further if I need to. We can also invert the output entirely, or we can make the nodes have a linear relationship with one another. I can also use blur radius. This softens up the edge transition areas of the mask, and it can add a nice contrast effect, as you can see here. I'll now show you the hue range live mask. I'm going to use quite a divisive technique, but it's a very quick way of illustrating what this mask can do. So I'll go to Layer, New Live Mask Layer, and I'll add a Hue Range Mask to this black and white adjustment. Now I can move the Hue Range down here, like so, or I can also use the Picker, then click on a colour to sample it. You'll see I've managed to isolate the red tones and I can quickly enter my mask preview here to confirm this. I could try reducing the overall hue range to see if I can remove some of the other areas from the mask. Then I'll get back 
to my composition, and I'll check Invert Output down here, and I now have a color pop effect. The third and final option we have is a bandpass mask. To demonstrate this, I'm first going to add a levels adjustment. Then I'm going to drag the black level almost all the way up. I will then add a bandpass mask to this adjustment. Now this type of live mask is best suited to subtle workflows. I'll turn on the mask preview and zoom in so we can better understand what's going on here. Think of the low band and high band sliders as low and high pass filters. By moving these sliders, we can fine tune the masking of edge detail. So, for example, I can move the low band slider to the left, and I'm now including more of the finer edge detail in the mask. I can also adjust the high band. And as I move this to the right, I start to include some of the flatter, less textural edge detail. I can also adjust this further by altering the intensity map. Now, if I just turn off the mask preview, let's look at what this is actually doing to the image. By masking the levels adjustment, I'm adding this dark contouring around the edge detail. I'll click the thumbnail here to get back to the mask settings. Then I can slowly start bringing the low band slider up and the high band slider down until the contouring becomes more subtle. Let's just preview that again. So this is the original image. Then this is with the contouring applied, achieved by using the bandpass mask on the levels adjustment. As I mentioned previously, the live bandpass mask is for these more subtle use cases. But if you want to see more examples of how to use all three masks, we have video tutorials for them that you can watch. Next up, we have layer states. These let us save different layer visibility configurations, which we can then easily switch between. Now first, we need to show the layer states panel. To do that, I can go to Window, States. I'll drag the panel out and float it so we can see it more clearly. So with this architectural visualization here, I've already set several states up. All of my main composition layers are currently being shown but I have a state that hides all the pedestrian cutout layers, but keeps the vehicles. I also have a state that hides all the cutouts, regardless of type. And I've also got a non-destructive charcoal filter state, which works best when certain other layers are hidden. So I have a layer state for that too. However, we also have a feature called smart layer states. I'll create a new smart layer state using this option here, and I'll call it no adjustments. I'll expand this here, and I now have a set of conditional parameters I can use to filter layer visibility. For example, I've color tagged all of my adjustment groups and layers with green, so I'll filter by layer tag here. Then I can click the hide button, and it will hide all layers tagged with green. I can click show, and all the layers tagged green will become visible again. You can also invert the filtering behavior by clicking here. So now this smart state will hide or show all layers that are not tagged with green. I'll quickly show you another example where you can filter by layer name. I'll create a new smart state and call it flares. Now I'll expand this and enable the layer name option. Now if I type flare in here, Ordinarily, this won't do anything, but I can enable regular expressions here, and I don't have to use any tokens or qualifiers for this. Any layer name that matches the string flare will be included. So now, if I choose hide, it will hide any layer that contains the word flare in its name. And of course, I can reverse this and show all layers that contain flare. There are going to be some interesting workflows you can create with layer states. Do check out the video tutorial for more examples of its use. We've now come to drag drop texture fills. When working with shapes and fill layers, you can now drop bitmap files directly onto the fill icon on the context toolbar. Let me show you a quick example with this diagram. I'll switch to the flood select tool, enable anti-aliasing up here, make a quick selection of this living area, then go to Layer, 
New Fill Layer. This will create a new fill layer, masked to the selection. I'll deselect, and Affinity Photo has automatically selected the gradient tool for me. Now, ordinarily, to turn this solid color into a bitmap fill, we would have to go up here and choose Bitmap, then browse to a bitmap file. However, what we can do now is actually get a bitmap file and drag it directly onto the fill here. Then I can click drag to set the scaling and rotation of the fill. This becomes far more useful, however, when we combine it with the assets panel. So what I'll do now is go out here, grab this entire textures folder, then offer it to the assets panel. This creates a new assets subcategory using the folder name and populates it with any valid files it finds, such as JPEGs. I can then just click drag one of these onto the fill to instantly change it. So you could feasibly have an entire library full of textures that you bring in. And you now have the option to quickly audition different bitmap fills on your designs. I just have one final thing with this feature I want to show you. I'll turn snapping on, then I'll select the rectangle tool and I'll quickly draw out a rectangle and snap it to the center. Then I'll move back out to my file browser and I'll grab one of these patterns and drop it over the fill. Now, if I scale this rectangle down, you'll notice that the bitmap or the pattern fill also scales with it. I can switch to the gradient tool using G and uncheck scale with object. Now, if I switch back to the move tool and I expand my rectangle, the pattern does not scale, it stays in place. So you can easily toggle between these two behaviors just by switching to the gradient tool and toggling this option up here. Next, we now have a normals adjustment, which lets you edit lighting information baked into a normal map texture. To use it, I'll go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, Normals. And on the dialog here, I can control rotation and scale. The Y axis flip is useful if you need to translate textures between OpenGL and DirectX rendering engines. OpenGL expects green channel values to be bottom up, whereas DirectX expects them to be top down. Aside from editing normal maps, here's an interesting use for this adjustment. I've rendered out this 3D scene using Blender, and with most 3D rendering engines, you can save out render passes, one of which will be a normals pass, which I've saved here. I'll drag this in to place it, get my move tool, turn on snapping to snap it in place. Then I will add a normals adjustment and click drag and clip it into the normals render pass layer. I can now control the lighting information stored in this pass. But we need a couple of extra steps to actually make this useful. First of all, above the normals adjustment, I'm going to add a channel mixer adjustment. Then I'll set its color model to gray. This produces a grayscale output. I'll then select the parent layer and set its blend mode to soft light. Now, if I go back into the normals adjustment, I can use this to completely alter the lighting balance. Moving on, the mesh warp filter is now available as a live layer implementation. This was mainly introduced for mockups. For example, where you have a magazine cover and you want to place an embedded document and warp it to the shape of the magazine, like I've done here. On my layers panel, I have the mesh warp as a non-destructive layer. And I can go in and modify it at any time if I need to. The beauty of doing this non-destructively is that if you place an affinity document or PDF that has multiple spreads or pages, you can easily switch between them on the context toolbar. When you have the move tool selected. However, you can also use mesh warp for corrective purposes. I may want to horizontally align the two turrets on either side of the castle here. So I can go and add a live mesh warp 
filter layer. Then up here, I'll change from destination to source. Now I'll find an area of this turret and double click to place a node. Then across on the other turret, what I'll now do is double click here to add my second node and drag this down so it aligns with that same area as the first node. Then all I need to do is switch from source to destination and the castle is now warped and the two turrets are perfectly horizontally aligned. I can also use Hide Mesh up here if I want to see the image unencumbered by the mesh grid. Now we come to an improvement in the Displace filter. The Displace filter in Affinity Photo has been somewhat criticized, shall we say, in the past, because of the method used to generate the displacement map. Well, in version two, you now get the choice between the old and the new methods. I'll add a live displace filter to this text and I'll choose to generate the displacement map from the layers beneath. This will now use the red-green channel offset method by default, which performs spatial displacement of the layer content. However, you can explicitly choose the old Sobel kernel method. And the effect is akin to a pixel diffusion. I found the old method quite useful for certain workflows, so having the choice here is really quite welcome. While I'm here, I also want to point out the flexibility of having displacement available as a live filter layer. Ordinarily, using the regular filter version would rasterize the text so you could no longer edit it. And once you've set the displacement strength, that's it. You can't change how it looks. With the live filter version, however, you can transform the layer, all you want, and the displacement will update dynamically based on the layer content beneath it. You can also edit the text with the displacement being applied. I just wanted to make you aware of that because it's really useful for a non-destructive workflow. All the Affinity apps have gained two new export formats. We've got WebP, which is useful for web designers, but more excitingly, we now have JPEG XL export as well. Here I have a 32-bit HDR document I've been working on. And on the 32-bit preview panel, I'll just enable EDR so we can see the extended brightness range. Normally I would have to tone map this so it can be shared as a standard dynamic range image. With JPEG XL gradually getting wider support as a file format, and with extended or high dynamic range displays becoming more accessible, we can now start to consider sharing our original HDR content as well. JPEG XL supports encoding at 32-bit unbounded precision, meaning those high dynamic range pixel values can be retained. Previously, the only way to get HDR imagery out of Affinity Photo was to export to OpenEXR or Radiance HDR. These are both interchange formats rather than sharing formats. So JPEG XL will become more important as time moves on and HDR image support gains more ground. Finally, there's a small improvement to the stock panel, which lets you place royalty-free stock imagery into your documents. If I move across to the stock panel on the right here, agree to the terms and conditions and search using a simple keyword here, I can now drag a stock image onto the blank document area and instantly create a new document from it. The new document will use the stock image's pixel resolution, color profile, and bit depth. So this is a quick approach if you want to use stock imagery as a starting point. If you already have a document open and you want to start a new document with a stock image, you can simply drag it to the top toolbar instead. And there we go, a roundup of all the major new features in version two. Now, I've gone over all the main features pertinent to Affinity Photo, but don't forget to check out the What's New videos for designer, publisher, and also the iPad versions, as you might discover some additional functionality that you can benefit from in Photo as well. Thank you for watching.